procedure to break into the publishing industry. Um, <laughs> so yesterday we had a panel on literary agenting and you can find that on YouTube for anybody who missed it. Um, and so today we're going to take you into the next stage of that process, the editorial. Um, so before I hand over to the panelists to introduce themselves, I'm just going to give a few housekeeping tips. Um, so please join the conversation in the chat on social media. Um, we have a hashtag, hashtag being black on publishing, and you can tag out that Sabra Republic. Um, we will be taking questions during the session, so we can get your questions ready in the chat, and then we'll ask them for about 20 minutes towards the end of the session. Um, and then as part of this forum, we will also be doing a um, internship program. So we have information about that for people based in Nigeria who are interested in getting into publishing. Um, so we will have details on that on our website, on our social media coming up. So that's something to keep an eye on. Um, but yeah, let's get the editorial session started. Um, so Anuli, Chris, I said Anuli, Christopher, and Tabisa for joining us. Anuli is the managing director and co-founder of Narrative Landscape Press, an independent publishing company based in Lagos, Nigeria. Christopher is an assistant commission editor at Hot Education, which is a division of Hachette UK. And Tabisa is the founder of Black Bird Books, a pioneering publishing house dedicated to giving young black writers a platform to unearth stories that speak to the vast nature of the black African experience. Um, so as you see, you've got a wealth of experience here and they're ready to share their insights with you. So I'll also ask each of you in turn, what inspired you to pursue a career in publishing um, and specifically working in editorial? Um, can you share your journey and what drew you to the world of books? So and really, if you'd like to start, we'll go from there. Okay. Um, I want to make sure like everyone can hear me. Um, thank you very much, Leah. And um, it's a wonderful thing to be here and to be invited on for this important initiative. Um, so I will... So my, my journey into publishing and becoming an editor um, started right after university. I've always been a reader. Uh, I've always loved reading. Um, I never really envisaged or even understood what publishing was about until um, I finished university and I met the uh, publisher of Catch for Limited at the time, which was a young publishing company. And he was looking for talent. And um, I expressed my interest and, and you know, I got hired and it was a whole new world being um, being employed by a publishing company because I did not know what it, I didn't know what it entailed and I didn't understand what it meant. Mm -hmm. uh, but through that opportunity, um, first of all, you know, we, you know, it was at the time we were publishing authors like Chimamanda Adichie and Sefia Ta, um, but I started as a reader. Uh, the first time I learned how to read and how to, and how to assess and criticize work. That was my first job to read and to assess work and to send out rejection, rejection emails to people whose work did not meet the make the cuts. Um, and that that was a very good way to start my career to understand what was you know good material and what was not. Mm -hmm. um, I did that for and for a year before I was promoted to assistant editor. Um, when I became assistant editor, I did I did way more. I you know I said. Um, I was allowed to start proofreading and I said proofreading from there um, and doing more assessing and um, assess, assessments of manuscripts as well. Uh, so I started you know, taking chances on manuscripts at, at that point in time. And I did this for about two years. Um, by the time I did this for books for three years, then I was moved. We had an eponymous um, uh, magazine called Farafina, a, a literary magazine. Uh, so I was moved to Farafina, uh, the magazine, and I was made features editor. Uh, where we print, you know, we said I curated and managed um, articles from very wonderful um, African writers at the time. So we that we published online and in the print magazine. Um, and I did this for a year and a half before before I left. Um, I encountered, I mean, the way because publishing has was, has never been very structured, and there really has been no trajectory, career trajectory in you know um, in an editorial career. Um, so I freelanced for quite a while, but I started initiatives for my love for it for 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 publishing. Um, I started a you know um, I, I started a, like a reading initiative at the time with um, writer Igoni Barrett. Uh, where we feature people like Sitsi Dangaremba and being the latest being yeah, Biavanga uh, was, you You're know, the case. On, on Monday. Sarah, should I go on? Someone said something. Yeah, so can everyone make sure that they mute themselves, please? So to the panelists speaking. Thank you. 
Um, so, after, you know, I also got participated, but along the way, um, I, I, you know, I got invested in helping, you know, I freelance as an editor, working with other people. Um, then I also helped uh, along the way. I joined another publishing company, another company, and I helped them set up their editorial department. Um, I helped to um, make, uh, what do you call it? The, the city of Potakot was in Nigeria was made the world book capital. And I was part of the, the team that you know, initiated that and helped to launch that as well. Um, so I, you know, I, along the way, I just became an editorial consultant, editing um, before then I started my own company in 2016 and continued as an editor and the managing, edit, man, managing director of my own company as well. Um, which has been very, over the years, I've just grown in capacity and grown professionally as well because I've invested in reading and invested in the art of editing, which is an art and a science, which is what I tell people. Um, I also set up the a Society for Book and Magazine Editors of Nigeria, committed and dedicated to editors as well, to provide training and resources and to build capacity in 2018 as well, to show, um, and you know, because of my commitment to the editorial profession as well. Um, and that's been the case since then. Um, um, just committed and and that's the way that I sort of like evolved as an editor. And I got to the point where, you know, I started building um, sort of organizations to, to also um, invest in editors as well. Thank you. Amazing, thank you. I think I really like what you said about um, editing being an art and a science. I think there's a lot more that goes into the people might see with end products. I was really interested to see. And um, I think you kind of give us an oversight of the whole publishing industry too and how it grows and develops through your stories. That was very really interesting. Um, Christopher, do you want to go and tell us about how you got into the industry? What drew you to books publishing? Um, yes. So um, my, I suppose my journey was, um, uh, I would say, a bit bit not straightforward, a bit more boring. <laughs> um, same uh, same as well, uh, you know, what drew me to publishing is probably my love of books. Um, I, I wanted to, I did a English literature degree in London and then, and creative writing. And then I quickly realized, well, I was thinking about sort of like the careers that I could have after when I finished studying. And, um, and I thought that, you know, um, doing something in publishing would sort of like match up, you know, A, with my personality, but also with, you know, with my love for books. So um, when I finished uni, I decided to do the MA in publishing, which opened some doors for me um, in, um, uh, in the publishing world, because through the MA, through the masters, um, I got um, opportunities to do quite a lot of internships, uh, which I wouldn't have been able to do if I was trying to get them on my own. Um, so getting that network of the university and, um, and our head teacher was actually quite valuable um, because I did try to get into publishing before I did the master's and it was, it was really hard. <laughs> I just couldn't get any internships. Um, so uh, when I finished my master's, I, I probably thought about doing what most people do and you know they all want to get into trade editorial. That's what most people want to do. And, uh, but I couldn't get into trade. Um, it was just, um, the, you know, it was very competitive. Um, it was, it was just really hard to get into, um, to a trade job after, after uni. So I started exploring getting into academic publishing, which I had no idea, um, which I didn't really know well. Well, I did know a little bit because I did a couple of internships while I was at uni, but it was one of those area, which is, which is not very, um, um, I wouldn't say talked about, but it's it's not really um, highlighted. You know, when you when people talk a lot about publishing, it's always related to trade. Um, so I I sort of like accidentally ended up in academic publishing, and um, I, and I have really no regrets really because I really enjoy it. And I also I think the thing that I enjoy the most is that you can, um, it's easy to see, uh, to put your stamp on things in a way that you can actually, um, your impact is tangible because I'm publishing books um, for schools that kids are going to be using and learning from. And, you know, it's actually quite, you actually, you actually feel like you have a lot of responsibilities 
um, towards towards the content because you know you want to make sure that you know like all those kids growing up you know they can see themselves in you know history books geography books and 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 obviously being what I am or making sure that you know it's not biased and it sort of you know doesn't perpetuate stereotypes so yeah so I sort of like stumbled accidentally into academic publishing now I work in education at uh, Hodder I've been there for about three years and um, yeah that's kind of my <laughs> my journey <laughs> Amazing, Christopher. Thank you very much. I think you're right that yeah, there's two things people think of uh, publishing in general, think of editing as opposed to all the other roles that come up with it, and think of trade publishing as opposed to all the other avenues and books that exist. Yeah. So it's great, great that you give us that different perspective on the different parts of editing within the industry. Um, Demisa, can you go next and tell us about your journey into publishing and editing? So how I got into publishing was really just like being naive and completely stupid because I had studied engineering before and I mean I should have stayed there um, but I didn't I studied engineering I really hated it and I've gotten into it because um, there was a program when I was in when I was doing you know grade 12 there was a big program in the country of getting girl, girl children into science and I'd kind of fallen into that because they're going around just like really collecting the kids that were good in math and science and I fell into it even though I'd, I'd always been like stories, words, reading. Um, I, it, it got me so depressed. I spent four years doing it. I was very depressed. I knew it was something I didn't want to do. I went back to my dad. He understood because he'd seen me grow up. So I went and studied publishing um, at the University of Pretoria. And much like Anuli, I didn't like I, I didn't have a full grasp of what publishing was until I got into it. You know, I'd always kind of believed that books were something that was done overseas. Um, like I thought the most I could do was be a journalist if I wanted a career in words and storytelling. So I did three years um, uh, of uni and I then set up for about two years and I didn't get a job because I was doing like odd admin jobs because the publishing industry here is very small. Um, I'm in South Africa, just for context mm -hmm. to everyone that joined later. Mm -hmm. Publishing industry here is very small. Um, I mean, that should have given me yet another hint, but I didn't take mm -hmm. it. Um, and I I got an internship um, two years after, mm -hmm. I, after I graduated. And I got it at Jocana Media and it was um, like just like a general internship where you do um, everything really. Um, and then they took me on after that internship. Um, and I started with them as a junior publisher. So um, what we what we call publisher here, and that you guys call it editors. So yeah, it's a bit similar. And I was a junior publisher for like two years, I wanna say. Then went into being a publisher. And then while I was publishing there, I started publishing in South Africa when the narrative was black people didn't read. And so one of my biggest challenges coming in as a young black publisher was to kind of deal with that and work against that. And, and I did, we did, um, you know, cause that, it wasn't just me, it was with the backing of the company. And um, in 2015, so five years into, uh, my work career, my then bosses uh, who at Jacona Media set me down and said, look, it looks like you've got a very strong editorial direction, um, you know, and your list is solid and strong. And we think you should have your own imprint where you can just like really carry on um, doing the work that, that you're doing. Uh, but at that time, I was publishing like really high profile people, celebrities and all of that. Um, and they were bringing in the money. And so they were just seeing, you know, they were seeing Rand signs. And, and then that's how we we, we established Blackbird Books um, as an imprint under Jakarta Media. But, you know, as a person, as you, as a Black person, as you get more conscientized and you realize that, you know, your responsibility is, you know, much, much bigger than what you'd initially thought. And that's how I gravitated towards uh, publishing debut writers. You know, just it wasn't enough to publish just Black people. It had to be, it had to have a course. So that's how I ended up publishing debut 
black writers because more and more the industry was really when even when they were because when I came in and we started publishing black people um in their num in numbers and then the rest of the industry you know kind of started realizing that they could make money out of it but even then they really um still wanted to publish only those black people with some kind of social currency and I realized then that that means that we 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 ran a risk of losing talent in chasing celebrity. Um, and so that's what became um, Blackbird Books and, what, and how it turned into a platform and how I suppose I found myself in advocacy instead of just like chasing bottom lines. I wish I'd chased bottom lines. <laughs> I think you even touched on something there that I will, maybe we should make clear to all these aspiring publishing professionals, that it's not an industry to go into if you're dreaming of making a lot of money, and that's just no. the reality. <laughs> Nobody in publishing is making a lot of money. No, it's not. <laughs> so I think we should all be upfront and honest with that. Um, so thank you for sharing, I can relate a lot. As somebody who did a law degree and his parents, his mom still says, you know, you could have been a lawyer <laughs> I'm working in publishing, I could definitely relate to engineering background. Um, and thank you for like touching on something that I touched on one next, which I want to ask about, you know, as being a black advocate in the South African publishing space. So I think I want to ask all of you just talk about why do we need more black editors today in publishing. Um, obviously, we call this forum the being black in publishing, because we see that there's a lack of black people across the industry. And we want to I'd give people more opportunities to know about it and get into it. So why is that so important? And what role do you think a black editor can bring that, you know, will give a different insight to the industry? So Christopher, do you want to go first to this one? Sure. Um, well, we need more black people in the industry because the, you know, the honest and the honest first answer that I that I can give today is that I'm just tired of being the only one in the office. Um, so <laughs> that's my first one. The second is um, probably maybe I'm just going to talk about a specific experience um, that happened. I mean, that specific experience was quite dramatic, uh, and it happened a few years ago. But that doesn't mean that it hasn't sort of like happened like in small doses since then. So I'm just going to talk about that one. Um, so I was working, when I was working for Cambridge University Press, I was working on a history book, a GCSE history book. And um, and re I remember reading the book and thinking, wow, this is, this is, this is actually vile. Um, in a sense that it was just perpetrating lots of stereotypes, you know, you know, saying, um, throwing out a lot of assumptions without any uh, data to back up to back that up, and um, it wasn't it wasn't very much it wasn't a professional work in my opinion. Um, if you are if you call yourself a professor if you call yourself a scientist, um, you know you need to like be able to like you know throw throw down a research and data to back up your research. Anyway, um, so I'm in a room where I, I have this manuscript on the table and, you know, I'm raising my concerns and about this book perpetrating things that we don't want to be, we don't want to keep perpetrating. But the thing is, I'm the only one in the room who thinks that way. <laughs> so I'm, I, you know, and, and it, you know, it puts, it puts me in a, in a difficult decision, difficult position, you know, also being black, you, ever, you don't ever want to be the person that's always fighting, but I feel like, I feel like there need to be more people who are, who want to fight for, um, for change in, you know, in the academic world, because otherwise you just keep on like throwing out things that are completely outdated. And I remember one of the sentences that, you know, I got from, you know, someone high up, one of the MD in the room saying that, oh, this is, this is how we teach history. It's always been like that. You know, I know it feels that way when you read it, but, you know, like they have to throw a lot of like numbers out there, a lot of data, and it feels, it feels very strong and it feels very biased, but that's just the way we teach history. But that's, that's, that's a problem. Um, to think like that it's a problem to think that you know you can't change anything you can't you can't stop the wheel and you can't you're just gonna have to keep keep throwing things out there that just that just not fit for 21st century so yeah so I do think that we need more black people in the industry so um, you know we need more voices um, to raise this kind of concerns and um, to you know to, to have more more weight and power in a decision making room to change things really so yeah 
Thank you. So that's very well put. And I think you're right. I think, you know, books are a tool of spreading ideas, ideology, education, in that instance. So what goes into them really doesn't matter. And the people who are making those decisions, you know, a lot of times the editor has a lot of say. It's not just a writer, you know, as I just yeah. said, we can shape the manuscript um, in a lot of ways with our opinions or feedback. So that perspective that having black people in the room for is really important. Absolutely. Right. And really, is there anything you'd like to add from that? Uh, not much. I mean, she said a lot already. That's why we need more. Um, Black voices in in publishing, I, you know. One of the things I find is um, in my in my experience as an editor, you know, the way that um, style and language has evolved over time has been very interesting. Um, especially, you know, I would take for example, you know, the because I I love I love you know a good style guide. That's 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 my superpower. Like if you tell me how do you, you know, how do you, you know, how do you use this? And I'm like, okay, you know what? Let me just look through <laughs> that and this and this and this, you know, you know, at the point we became like I just used to get phone calls. Like, how do you use the Italic again? I'm like, okay. But I think what's been very profound is how we have been able to um defend the reason why we use our language and our perspectives in the way that we use them um for instance you know so say that tab tabiso tabiso right you you know so say that she was a word but she's not a foreign word and i don't have to put her name in italy because i mean i don't have to defend that to say that i can use my my language as the as the uh, the, the the latinos do and when they write in spanish and they don't even explain what it is that they are writing but they write it and because it's an expression of themselves you know and i think that it is it is okay for us to be that to be that way we need to find more people who understand that and to push that forward to say that look because in Nigeria, I'm equal by tribe. I'm going to write a sentence in Igbo, and I'm not going to explain it. Maybe you should go figure out what it, what, what, what it is. But that's the way that I have chosen to explain myself. And I'm going to put it in Italy as well, because that is the way that I want to push my perspective. Yeah. Um, and I think that that is very important to be able to define ourselves in our language and the ways that we present these things. That they, that I find that a lot of, you know, we, we, a lot of people don't, you know, understand or get questioned for I would give you uh, a very uh, you know another an example as well not even relating to, to I have my in respect so can everyone mute themselves please Sorry. so we were going to in at Nari Solansky Press we're going to acquire a work I was very interested a Nigerian writer very young very prolific and I liked what she was doing and I thought to myself Oh, okay. You know what? The her world rights are hanging somewhere in North America. Let I you know. I would be very nice for you know to have her in this region. And so I reach out to them and I'm like, okay, I'm interested in you know this writer and I want to acquire her work for the region that I cover. And she comes back to me and she says, oh, that she's you know she says, oh, I've gone through your websites and it's all in English. She was like, you know, where are the where are the 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 local languages that you publish in? And I find, and I found, you know, it's, I found her very ignorant. And I'm like, I don't, you know, Nigeria is an English speaking country. I don't, you know, I don't publish in, I don't publish in, 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 in my, my, my local languages. I publish in English. And she's like, oh no, they're not interested unless I publish in our local languages. I'm just saying that I'm, I'm speaking also to the stereotypes as well, you know, that they expect us to fit into certain boxes and we need more people to be able to, you know, defend what we do to push what we do, to say it's okay to do what we do um, and, you know, not be told that what we do is foreign. You know, I think that would be, that would be, you know, that, that's why we need more, more black voices in, in publishing. That's a really great point. I always think of how there's so many things about, you know, English countryside culture or America that I've most just through reading these books that haven't been explained to me because they assume that everyone knows what freshman is or everyone knows these tropes, you know, but we just learn that because we're used to reading outside of ourselves. Whereas, you know, a lot of the publishers meet up people who haven't had to read outside of themselves. And that's why they think these things need to be over explained. But yes. the reality is, if you can pick up something about niche American Midwest culture, you can pick up something about Nigerian Igbo culture as well just by reading it, you know? So that's yeah. what, Really great point, thank you. Um, to be so, you kind of already spoke about the importance of this in your introduction. Is there anything you want to add finally on the point about the need for black editors specifically? Look, for me, it really is that when, you know, publishing and any creative um, work really is very subjective, right? Like, so, you know, editors, publishers eventually must connect to a, a work to have it uh, published. And we can't say that 
in South Africa, if I'm like the only black publisher that I speak and stand for for every black um, experience that exists. So we need this just so much um, to blackness that exists that we need just as many people, um, you know, feel that the work filters through. It's just not fair um, to who we are um, as, as a race to have so few filters, you know, for, for who we are. We just, we just need more because, you know, we need different hands touching the elephant. Nicely put, thank you. Um, so I think, you know, the re main reason we put this together is to give people who don't know much about the industry or interested in ghost publishing get some insights in, and some guidance on what could help them. So could you speak to what skills and qualities that you believe are essential for becoming an editor, you know, habits or things that you can build early on before getting into the industry? I know Anne really spoke about learning to read the editorial eye. You know, so, um, yeah, if anyone wants to go first, I'll throw that over to you guys. I will start and I'm only going to, I'm going to, I'm going to emphasize, especially for someone who's coming into the industry and is interested in joining the industry. I say this all the time, all the panels that I speak, all the seminars where I, you know, I, 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 I am invited. I find that a lot of people want to be editors, but they don't read. You can't be an editor if you don't read. You can't, you can't be successful. There's no way in hell that you can be successful. I mean, that's the only thing I would speak to. I would let Christopher and Tabiso, you know, add more to it, but it's just there. You can't say you want to be an editor, you know? And then I also want to disabuse the idea that, okay, because you want to be an editor, it's only African literature that you would read. No, you know, you have to read everything, everything. You know, that's, that's why we're editors. We have to understand context. We have to understand you know, people's styles, we have to understand why, uh, you know, we have to be able to filter, like Tabiso has said, we have to understand all these things, you know, so it's, I get a lot of, oh, you know what, I was only African literature, I read, I don't read anything else. No, we read everything, everything, science books, religious books, read everything. I, I'll let Christopher and Tabiso, you know, add their own words of wisdom. <laughs> you've, you've put it really well. <laughs> yeah, I think that Amen. the reading... <laughs> The reading is really non-negotiable, really. Yeah. Um, you've got to you've got to be a reader. You've got to be able to watch and suss out trends, um, because I mean, in the end, publishing is a business, and you do need to um, publish to the trends. I mean, not be stifled by them, but to for for business to make sense, you do need to to be able to publish to them. Um, but otherwise, it, 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 it's just you've got to have the passion for it. I remember when I was in second year studying publishing, um, you know, I, I used to tell because I had a very warped sense of what publishing was. In my head, it was very sex in the city, um, you know, and and my lecturer, shame, bless her, brought me down quite gently because I had imagined, look, a life of Jimmy Choose and Manolo Blahnik. <laughs> and... <laughs> Well, and, and now thank God because I'm fed and I'm fed into them. But you know, you have to. Be, it has to be passion driven, um, because you're not going to make a fortune out of it. And I think, mm -hmm. and, I, and 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 that is where I'm finding that you know, 13 years in, I've given all that I'm going to give. Um, I, I kind of feel like it's time for me to go chase the money now. But you've, <laughs> you've got to be able to 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 rely on the passion to push you because your bank account won't be pushing you so be very passionate about it um i suppose in some way where we are as a generation is you're going to have you're going to need to have some level of advocacy um to want to do this work I think yeah, let's not put everyone off too much, but yes, it's not an industry as we had before to make money in, but it's still very worthwhile and being out because it'll be very fulfilling in other ways. So. Yeah, absolutely still worthwhile. I mean, that's 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 why we're still there uh, in a way. Um, yeah, but just to follow up on that is that you, you have to make sure that you go into the industry for the right reasons and um, not because you have, you know, such an idea of what it is, but it's it's very rewarding work. Um, if you have the passion for it and if you've got the patience for it and also you have to bear in mind that it's also it's also an, an industry where you're not going to find um, you're not going to find a lot of concrete training to help you um, to, to help you develop your skills to help you develop 
you know, what you need to develop. So you have to have a lot of patience with yourself and you have to like also reach out to a lot of people um, and ask for help and, you know, just to make sure that you're going in the right direction. It's one of those industries that's completely bizarre, like, because you get into it, like thinking you might have an idea of what it is and then you got into it, it's completely wrong. And then, and then you think, oh, okay, so but when, how do I do this? But no one, no one, not no one, few people have the words on how to like guide you in what you really need to do. So a lot of it, I personally, my own experience, that like a lot of it, I had to like, sort of like self um, acquire. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it's, 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 it's sort of like an, an, an odd place in the sense that like you don't get the answer straight away especially in, I don't know you know what the culture is where you are but like in the UK it's like the the culture here it's like it's you know there's this culture where you don't people don't really sort of like they're very much in their own bubble they don't really share expertise straight away you need to like be embedded into the industry for a little while to start getting like real sort of insight of what you're meant to be doing so yeah, you just need a lot of patience and and definitely passion um, for it. And you can try it out. And if it doesn't work out, you can always <laughs> <laughs> move on to something else. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right about this. I think the best way to learn editing is just by editing, really. Yeah. Um, and I remember the first time I had a manuscript to edit, um, and I returned it to my boss, BB, the founder of Star Republic, to look over. I was just like you can't be this gentle like you need to actually I was like make a very light change I was like it's the author's work I need to be careful and then after she gave that feedback I just went into it again with more confidence and then that was the biggest thing that helped me editorially just actually knowing okay I can make these changes it's a collaboration between the author and the editor and you have that freedom to do it but again if I hadn't kind of had that go through and, and I was like to have you know somebody who could give me that guidance so I, I would also mention um in smaller publishing presses could be a really great place to start out your work in publishing because I think you're more connected to all the different parts that go into the job whereas and like, especially in the UK these big um, publishing companies like HarperCollins these companies everything's very separate editorial do their thing and marketing do their thing whereas in a small press you kind of get to see how everything connects together and I th oh, you muted yourself Leila you muted yourself Leila you muted yourself Sorry, yeah. is that better now? Yeah, yes. so um, especially early on in your career, I think getting some experience in a small press can be quite helpful to see how everything comes together and how editorial does tie into other aspects of um, publishing it as well. Uh, just to pick back off your point there. Um, but yeah, definitely read, 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 I think is the key thing we've come to <laughs> as our um, advice for you into the industry. If, if, I can, if I can just throw in one more thing, just, uh, I know that, you know, Tabiso and Christopher speak with so much passion, but it's not a glamorous job as well. I should, I always tell people, it's not a glamorous job. It's very monotonous, but it, you know, you have to keep reading and reading. At the point you, I realize that when you read, you don't read for, you don't enjoy, you don't read to enjoy it's anymore. It's not for pleasure. Sure. No, you stop reading for pleasure because you're just reading and looking at for why this works or how can I make this work? But it's not a glamorous job as well. I think it can be lonely. Thinking, People think, oh my God, it's publishing. Look, you know, look at the list of acclaimed people that, you know, high profile people that I'm publishing, but it's not, it's not. And I think reading with a critical eye, looking for faults is something that you can do at any stage in your life. So as you're reading that, I mean, I was always very good at that because I'm a natural critic. I like to complain or find issues with things. So I think having an eye where even if something that's been published and has those, of, if you see those issues with it, think it through as you're reading and try to articulate to yourself, what would I do differently? What would I advise? You know, because that's something you can constantly work on um, at any point in your life as you should be reading 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 um great so let's move on to another aspect of being an editor which is that author editor relationship um which is something that i think you'll all agree is very key to your work as an editor um so what advice would you give to newcomers on building those relationships and how they contribute to a successful book project oh i think first of all have boundaries establish highlight maintain boundaries you know because of the personal nature of the work um, it's very easy for them to like overlap. Like, you know, just now you're dealing with someone's manuscript, the next thing you're dealing with their dying mom or something like, and you, it's, it's very easy because it appeals to, you know, your humanness and who you are as a person. So you have to, these are, this is, this, these people are your nine to five and you really have to. And I remember being warned about this when I was much younger and just kind of being like, of course, a white person is going to warn me about that because they don't have Ubuntu. 
Uh, so, you know, I, I'm a black person. We, we, we are very, we, we commune, we community very well. Um, and no, don't, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Establish boundaries, keep those boundaries. Don't answer messages over a weekend. Just don't, um, just have boundaries. Authors, and they're very humble um, when you sign them. Super humble, very appreciative. Um, but when you, when they get to a point where they've tasted a little bit of fame, they've had a, one interview somewhere, um, they turn into complete, complete differently people. So just manage that and always remember that, you know, when they come and turn on you, that it's the job and it's not you. It's, it's such a, and it's difficult because the work we do is so personal, um, but you have to. The, those boundaries are very, very important. Just keep it like, keep it locked, keep it tight. I yeah. agree. I couldn't agree more. The way so I was going to phrase it, I was going to say, you know, just be professional. You have to understand that. I, I, I mean, I mean, this may sound a bit, a little extreme, but I always tell myself that, you know, I may know this writer, but I'll say this, the writer's not my, and I'm not going to, writer's not my friend. You know, I'm here to be a professional in this relationship. Um, because that's the only way I can help um, to handle their displeasure or their, you know, their, their complaints, you know, I can take it from a professional level, because if you get so involved in their lives, you know, you find that you cannot be very objective, you know, the way that you handle your work. Um, one tip I would say in managing the offer as much as, as, as best as one can is discipline. I think that's important. Um, so whatever it is that you have to do with an offer, it's good to put a timeline to it. And it's good to try to, you know, stick to that timeline and get them to commit to that timeline so that you can complete whatever it is that you have to and move on and move on very quickly. Um, so I, I think that's one important thing. Uh, Christopher, if you had anything, anything, I can't remember anything else, if you can't remember anything else to add. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you both are absolutely right. Um, probably what I was going to say is that you also have to not be afraid to, you know, it comes down to the fact that you have to remember that you work for a business, you work towards a strategic goal, you work, you work towards, you know, something, you know, that's going to contribute to something that's bigger than, than this book. So, you know, you shouldn't be afraid of, you know, of sometimes, you know, being assertive with an author. You know, I know you're having this and this problems, but here is the thing. If you don't deliver this by this deadline, I know in, a, in the ac academic, it's a bit more dramatic because we adhere to curriculum. Um, so the book has to be ready before the school year starts. If we're late, <laughs> then that's it. The kids don't have any books. <laughs> so it's, it's so I have to I have to be really strict all the time and chase my authors. And I know if we're all humans, I'm sure they have problems. I'm sure they have this, but you know, at the end of the day, it's a business. They signed a contract. They're supposed to be delivering by this date. And I have to be sort of like really strict and trying to like remove all the, I'm not going <laughs> to remove all the human side of the job, but like sometimes I have to like think, okay, you need to like a bit be also assertive in this job, um, especially in, uh, in academia. If I may just add one more thing, document everything, mm. your communication. Like don't make agreements over the telephone or WhatsApp. Very good. Um, don't don't document everything. All everything you agree to, all the terms you agree to, ensure that it's on. You know, there's a back and forth between you and the writer. It's very important. Yeah, email is your friend. Email um, is your friend. Is write everything down and don't promise anything to an author um, that you cannot like. You cannot um, deliver. You cannot deliver. <laughs> Uh -huh. yeah. I think yes, I think all boys as you is as your editor, your job is to have this professional relationship with an author. But because it's a creative industry, for an author, the book is their baby. They have a very personal relation to that, which can skew things from their perspective. So it's really important. And um, as I, to be said, it can be easy to get into a pastoral relationship with them that can cross lines, or you can feel that um, it can become an this relationship even without you meaning it to, because they're coming from a more sensitive place. You know, as editors, people publishing, we're investing money in this book. We clearly believe in it. But for an author, that can be hard for them to believe when they're seeing changes we made or to their baby you know 
Um, and so one thing, I've, on the other side of it, being more gentler, I've had to learn because the way I give feedback as an editor can be quite just straightforward here, all the issues <laughs> essentially. But then I have to learn because, you know, it's their baby, like I've said, to um, couch that in some, um, you know, point out what's good about the book too, not just the errors, the whole sound and method of feedback. I think that's, that's one part where you can be a bit gentler with authors as well, while maintaining boundaries. So I'll just throw that in as another point. Um, no, I, I, I agree. Okay, yeah. sorry, I was gonna just, you know, buttress what you said. I, I think it's important to, like going back to the details on how we work with them and give them feedback. Um, yeah, a lot of times, you know, if I if I edit if I edit something and I send it to them and I would tell them, you know, um, I tell them that my job is advisory. That this is the way that I, you know, I envision what I think their work should be, and I explain that from the beginning when I give them um, a review of what I think their work is. And I said, my voice, my work is advisory, but you can come back and tell me if you agree and disagree with me. If they come back with a valid point, why they don't agree with some things, I would, you know, I would speak to them. Uh, but if I do, if I don't agree with them, I would continue to have that conversation so that they would see my perspective. Um, especially if I'm invested in it, I would be a little persistent about it. But I'll be encouraging like Leila. I've had to learn to be encouraging, but that's why I'm <laughs> stressing that point. Um, but I think that leads quite nicely to the next question. So I want to ask if you guys could each describe a particularly challenging editorial project that you've encountered in your career, you know, and what strategies have I used to overcome those challenges? So building off now discussion, I've definitely had experiences with authors where I've given them extensive edits on the page and they've come back and really disagreed, you know, written a long response. But then when we've gotten either on a Zoom or in the room and we able to have a conversation through the feedback, then they've had a bit of space and they've been able to understand what I was saying to them. And that's made a difference. So that'd be my example. So if each of you could share um, any challenging project that you've done. When I've had people just like refuse to be edited. Like <laughs> the, they just refuse to be edited. And I don't, I personally do not, I don't do copy edit or like I do developmental work and then I hand over. Um, but there was a, a project that I worked on like many years, so many years, some years ago, 2017, I think, where it was a celebrity who just at that point had people kind of polarized around her as a brand. And some the ones that really loved her loved her. The ones that hated her really hated her. And so the book went out with some errors. And it, it really, it became like a national storm. Every news crawl, uh, you know, there it was, every news bulletin and my name, and it was just, it was the worst thing to go through. And I mean, you know, you just kind of carry on and you, you know, recall the book, you know, redo it or whatever. And, but I don't think I've ever recovered from that. I'm very bad. I mean, I get one bad review, I crumble. So that was like death. Um, it took me so many years. I actually packed up for a year. I went to live with my dad. I couldn't deal with it. It was terrible. Um, but I think that's because it's like your work is so personal and it's so attached to, to, to you. And at that point also, um, I've got this Blackbird Books brand and it's attached to my face. So it's not like all the other white publishers who publish anonymously under their company name. Like for me, it had it had to be me. Like I, people were online, um, di you know, dissecting my weight instead of this work. And it was just the worst thing that I'd ever been through. And yeah, it's it's kind of, it shifted, it shifted who I was. It really changed who I was. And I think, yeah, I, yeah. I haven't, I don't know how to say you get over it. You don't, you just learn to live with it, I suppose. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Teresa. Yeah, I'm not sure, again, if I can if these are hard to go over that too. I think, um, you know, we're editors with people, we're going to be, um, and you know, we're gonna react personally to these things too, as it is. And then I think developing a thick skin is one of the unglamorous and harsh realities of being an editor as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. 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 Um, uh, I would say that I think my worst experience uh, was a time when I was editing a debut, mm -hmm. a writer's debut work. And and, and I, th I think this had more to do with me, my, my preparedness than um, the work. Uh, so I was, you know, I was given this manuscript and I knew that I did not have the time 
to handle the Spanish career, but I still took it on. And just like Tabiso, developmental editing is my superpower. And I, I don't know how to copy edits. But if I did, if I do developmental editing, I hand it over to someone else because I can't see anything beyond the big picture. Mm. So I took on this book and I knew very well that I wasn't very committed. I, you know, I didn't take the time to analyze what the problems were. Um, and I sort of, I sort of, you know, just went over it really lightly and and I submitted the work and I gave it back to, you know, and the editor wrote me this very long email, the publisher, sorry. And then I was freelancing, sent me this very long, embarrassing email. It's complaining about the poor quality of work. And I felt so embarrassed, you know, but I was humble. I, I like to think I was humble. You know, <laughs> I said, please, could they give me like a breakdown of what the problems or what the, you know, the problems that they had to fix. And so she, she, she did a rundown and she gave me a breakdown. And I said, thank you very much, you know, but I decided, you know, if I want, if I'm not prepared for anything, time or I'm going through, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do something. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take on any, any work with me because it was, it was really bad. Like the plots, like the plot holes were not fixed. Um, the characters, you know, weren't weren't fixed. Nothing was fixed in the book. And I submitted it that way. And I feel very embarrassed. I think that's one of the worst things I've ever, I've ever done um, in publishing, in my as an editor anyway. For me, it was, um, it was also early in my career when I was at Cambridge Press. Um, uh, God, it was such a long time ago. Um, I hardly, it feels like it was a life, a lifetime ago. But um, I remember like being like, some comes down to, again, being, you know, overwhelmed with workload. Um, I just had a lot on my plate and I had to like manage an impossible number of authors and loads of manuscript to deal with. And, um, and like we've talked about, like, the author's manuscript, like it's it's their baby. It's, you know, sometimes it's, it's the life work. And so they can get very emotional about it. And and um, so I, I remember, I mean, I don't quite remember what led to this. It's a complete blur, but I remember sending him an email to this author, like a very, a too honest email. I think, I think I've crossed the <laughs> I crossed the boundary of being professional in the sense that I didn't need to be so honest. <laughs> um, so, and I was I was impossibly honest with his manuscript, and I was also impossibly honest with his way of working. And um, and yeah, the next thing I knew, um, unfortunately, this this particular author. I, to be honest, I had no idea who that guy was. I didn't even know he was like a big name in academia. Uh, but he obviously knew our managing director and reached out to them and complained about my behavior. And I felt horrified. And in hindsight, you know, looking back, I feel like, you know, it, it's really funny because it affected, my email affected that author so much, you know, and it made it made them in a, in a way where they're just like, they basically like called everybody at Cambridge Press to complain about me. And, and I can't even remember right now what what was it what, what it was that I had that I fed, fed back to them so I think you know there's going to be like times where I mean the it's not it's not unique to to academia or whatever but in publishing everybody's overworked um especially when you work for like big corporation because obviously you know they want to make as much money as possible and which means that they always like hire the bare minimum like staff number so you, you will always have a lot of work but I think it's important to sort of like always take a step back and learn to say no to work when you don't have time um and you know so you don't so you don't end up in a situation where you end up sort of like you know ruining someone's life <laughs> so yeah no that was a great, yeah, I think that kind of feeds back to what I said earlier about author-editor relationships, how you have to be deliberate in every interaction you have an, with an author because of their relation to the work. Um, but I think that's a good point too about learning to set boundaries with your own work and, you know, not taking on too much of your play or as with Emily's story about, you know, only editing when you're in that mind frame. But sometimes I've had to not work an editor all that day because I know I'm not in the headspace to do it. I work on something else and then bring that back another time. So um, that's a really good point. So thank you everybody for um, sharing your questions in the chat. There's quite a lot, so I think we're only going to get to a couple of them. But I'll go through those now. So, um, so Christopher, you mentioned before about how there isn't any formal training opportunities. Are there any courses, diplomas, etc., that the panelists know of? Any formal training that there is available that people could look into? 
Um, I mean, I can only speak for Hachette. Um, there are there are a few opportunities at Hachette actually that are quite amazing. There's, um, I think, once a year they organize. Um, um, they have this big recruitment process where they hire uh, 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 interns. Um, they, they organize paid internship uh, at and it lasts for a period of twelve months. So it's quite substantial. And the really great thing about this um, this program is that you, you get to actually work in different part of businesses. You get to work. Um, of course, Hachette has both a trade business and an education business. So you get to work in education, you get to work in trade, you get to work in marketing and editorial. You also have a, a placement in a bookshop in London. So that's, you know, it's a really sort of like great comprehensive program. And I think they run it one, once a year. Recently, they also uh, released a, um, a new um, program about um, not, I don't know if it's about training, but yeah, I think it's training um, um, for anybody who's interested in doing, doing freelance editing. So um, I think you sign up to it and they, you know, you have like trainings for, I don't know how long the training is, to be honest, I can't remember. I think it's probably about it's a few weeks or three months. Um, so you learn the, the ropes on, you know, freelance editing and um, having that network you can also directly get some work um at the back of that um so you can do you could do that from anywhere you are in the world in the world i know that program just finished i think last month but they're, they're thinking about running it again so you should keep you should keep an eye out on the website and and sign up to a newsletter or whatever to to find out you know when it's coming out next so yes yeah, so there are quite a few things um happening at Shed, which is really good Great, thank you. Um, do you have any, any other training treaties you want to share? We, so, I mean, South, okay, oh, sorry, sorry. Go. No, no, you go ahead, please. In South Africa, we you can study publishing um, on both undergrad and postgrad level um, as a degree. Um, and the, the nice thing about those programs is they expose you to industry as opposed to when I was studying, you didn't get a lot of exposure to industry. But now, because I mean, as, as an industry person, I, I am in the universities a lot, lecturing, guest lecturing, part-time lecturing. So you get really exposed. Um, but yeah. Even if it's brown. Sorry about that. But yeah, like if you've done like journalism or English um it, it you can like approach publishing houses and say hi I, I've got this we don't have the kind of programs that Christopher's talking about this sounds amazing uh but yeah you can approach people and just try so um I I mean like like I said I founded a I co-founded um, an organization called the Society for Book and Magazine Editors of Nigeria in 2018 to provide um, resources and training. Unlike Tabiso, I did not have a I did not have a structured path to to publishing. I did not study publishing. I have a degree in English and literature, uh, but that still did not prepare me for publishing. Uh, so I had to, you know. So basically, I'm self taught. You know, I evolved that way. Ex please plus my experience in publishing the rest. So. Um, you know, through, you know, part of, it's a non-profit, you know, we do a lot of advocacy and we try to get um, subsidized um, training for people, highly subsidized for people who are interested in editing. Uh, so we run a, we run a year long program, um, short programs and extended programs, I would call it, um, for editors. Um, but for editors who are not in Nigeria, I would suggest that one of the ways to get training is to join a society. You know, I think I, I cannot emphasize more. I don't know why a lot of times we don't think that we should be part of a community. Um, I find that resistance anyway here in Nigeria. But I think it's important to join a community who, that can, you know, create a, a defined path for you. If you don't have universities that teach publishing, then you can learn from university. Um, and then there are other courses on Coursera and on the open, open edu education sites, I think, that offer courses in editing and the rest of them you can go there and you can do that as well so there are different pathways to acquiring skill and learning about editing the in-house hatchet program in narrative landscape press my publishing company we don't have such a defined program but we have a what we call a submission internship so those are the interns that we've been doing this for the last three years where we get people who go through the submission pile 
and they recommend and we have these conversations about you know what is worth what should we pick and what should, you know shouldn't we pick but it's been really helpful especially just I think through that process also they learn to assess in manuscripts as well so we've been doing that for the last three years so we had there are all this all these um ways that you could learn you know editing if you're interested out there Great, thank you. Those are all really great opportunities. Um, and then also there is an internship program that will be running as part of being Black in Publishing, um, which will have information about how to apply um, soon and as we're starting in January. So we'll share information about that on our platforms later. A uh, couple of people asked about degrees. So I just want to respond quickly to say you don't need a specific degree or an English degree. A lot of people assume to get into publishing. I have a law degree to visit engineering, as you've learned. Um, there are masters in publishing, but even those aren't necessary to work in the industry. They can just be helpful. Um, and I think in some ways having external work experience to so come into the industry can also um, be seen as an asset and a fresh perspective. Um, but obviously you do need just that interest in reading, that good communication skills, and then doing practical things like internships and actual practical work, entry work into the ground. Is, experience is probably what's going to be the most um, important. So I'll just do a couple quick questions before we finish off. Um, do the panelists think that having a mentor is needful in the editing industry and do they have any tips on how to approach a prospective mentor? One or two of you want to touch on that. I'll repeat the question. So do panelists think that having a mentor is needful in the editing industry and do they have any tips on how to approach a prospective mentor? You know, for me, mentorship for me really isn't having someone you do weekly reports with. It's it's just identifying someone whose work you admire and just learning everything you can about them. What I find is more important is to have uh, contemporaries that you can that you can like bounce things off of. So I've got very close relationships with other indie publishers. Um, I know I can call BB if I'm, I'm I need to make a decision about something and I'm a bit stuck. You know, um, I know I can call Colleen from Mojachi Books or I can go to Penn Macmillan. It's just really, it's, it's about identifying, you know, the trajectory that you want for your career, looking at someone who has done it, looking at how they've done it, because there'll be, there'll be information everywhere, really. Um, and, and just if you get an opportunity to meet that person, great stuff. If you ever get the opportunity to talk to them, great stuff. But not having proximity to them shouldn't limit who your mentor can be, you know, just by them having done what you want to do is enough for you to study. That That's my core belief when it comes to like when someone emails me and says, uh, would you mentor me? I'm just like, I don't know what to do in that instance. Am I supposed to feed you? Am I supposed to check if you're breathing every morning? I just don't, I, I don't know what you want. <laughs> that that's a good extreme. <laughs> nicely, nicely, <laughs> I think. Um, and that really ties into, I don't really know what you're saying before about the need for community. In, in yes, and yeah, that's just what she's saying. You know, you know, you you just identify people who can help, and you reach out to them. I was reading um, a research done by um, there's an there's an editor society in Australia, and they carried out a mentorship program. Um, and at the end of the program, I think they ran it twice, and it was inconclusive. You know, weighing you know what they gained. Um, at the end of the program, you know whether they actually learned how to edit or not. You know, it was really inconclusive. Um, and it's a very expensive thing to say you're going to mentor someone in terms of time, especially if you run a very lean system. You know, if you're like, you know, you're running a very small business and you have a very lean, it's, it's not. So I would say that, look, editing is like writing. You know, you tell writers all the time, if you're going to get better. You practice writing all the time. If you want to be a great editor, you practice editing all the time and you will get better. And like, you know, Tabiso said, if you get stuck about something, like the way people call me all the time and say, oh, we, how do you, how do you use a uh, punctuation marks in this thing? I'll tell you, okay, which, you know, which uh, style that are you using? You know, what Bible are you using? Are you using this? Are you using that? You know, and then it opens a whole, you know, another level of conversation. So whatever it is that you need, you know, I would suggest have people, you know, that you can always reach out to and just apply yourself, really, you know, think the way that the writers apply themselves and I think that you will if you apply yourself I think you will see your skills evolve 
you will see yourself evolve. You understand when you read a lot, you understand by the time you read something, you read another thing, you will see the difference. You'll be awed by, you know, whatever it is that you're reading, the growth of a writer, the way that you see the way that they have, they've grown over their first, their second, their third novels. You would begin to understand what is important, what is necessary, what makes a good novel, you know, and what, and what you apply to it to make it a good, you know, a good novel. So I, I think that's the, basically the only way to go about it. My opinion, subject. I'm going to add to that. Um, definitely, I think, I think when you when you when you start a new career, it's yeah, it's it would be more helpful if you find um, networking is really important, um, and just finding your peers and finding people who are probably the same level as you, a little bit higher, or but you know people you can be friends with. You know, like Tabisa said, like someone you can call up and say, hey, listen, I'm reading this thing and I really don't, I'm really stuck. Can you, can you give me a hand? It's people you can like, you know, you know, you can call and rely on when you have, when you have an issue. But these come like some sort of like, you know, um, you know, it can come to the form of, not, I wouldn't say friendship, because they're not your friends, but some sort of like, uh, you know, good sort of like corporate camaraderie. If I call it that way, I think a mentor for me personally, I think that getting a mentor, uh, a mentor w has a purpose when you probably maybe like reach like a certain level in your career. Um, if you especially if you work for like a huge corporation um, and you have like sort of like clear, clear path uh, in terms of career uh, progression. And when you re reach a certain level, it can be useful to have a mentor who can sort of like help you, you know, achieve certain objectives that kind of like help you to sort of like you know, go through that next that next step. So a mentor can be helpful, but I think you know, at different stages in your in your publishing career, I think at the beginning, I think you just you, you need to really just focus on networking. Yeah, and I'll say for that, you can um, in the UK there's a society of young publishers that you can join before you um, yes. got into industry. And just going to book launches in the area, if that's the thing, or book events, and just kind of immerse yourself in the scene, get to know authors, people who work in publishing will be there, and just make sure you're involved. Um, so I think I'll just have one final question because we're running a bit over. Um, being an editor, how do you deal with time management in the aspect where you are to edit a voluminous book within a short time? So I think time management is kind of the big million dollar question <laughs> as editors. Do you have any advice or guidance on that? Okay, my answer to that is I will not ever, <laughs> ever, ever edit a voluminous work in a short time. I will not. Period. Maybe you have contributions, Christopher and Tabiso, but I will not do that. <laughs> I'm just speaking on time management in general, because I think even with editing, there's always, no matter the size of the book, there's timelines to me, or you're balancing that along with. There's always it's not just editing as editor. You know, you're doing other work, you're doing cover briefs, you're doing these other yeah. aspects of tasks as well. So how do we balance that? And manage your time as an editor. That's a, that's a, such a broad question because time time management is one of those things that you learn with the job. You learn it's a bit it's a bit like a, it becomes a it's sort of like you know if you want it to be it can become second nature to you but it, it takes time to learn about time management you have to learn about your job and you have to learn about the industry and how you you know how long you have to learn about yourself about how long it takes you to read a manuscript you know to a certain length you know and it, it, will, it will come with time you're not going to master time management your first year you come into publishing <laughs> um it's not gonna happen like you know some people have been working I, I know people who've been like in the same company for like 15 years and they're still very bad at time management so but you know there's there's, there's techniques, techniques you can you learn, can learn. Oof, I'm echoing. there's techniques you can you know learn, learn. there's like um uh, programs you can use for example myself I use like um, things like a program called Trello it's like a project management uh, mm. software and then so I, I can like you know assign myself my weekly tasks and with deadlines and I know when things are coming up and stuff like that so that, there's things that you can use to help you you know to help you and you can you should use those things if you need them some people don't um, but yeah I mean it's it's quite a, kind of a hard question I think time management for me um, you know, especially working in an industry where you get like a lot of like uh, manuscript in one go that you have to go through is it takes time in a sense as well be because it takes like confidence to be able to say to also say no and you have learning to say no is takes time you know because especially when you're starting out you you know you want to you know you want to prove yourself you want to 
prove, you know, you want to make sure that whoever's hired you is not disappointed. <laughs> and you, you, you know, you sort of like, you, you tend to always say yes. And you tend to also because you don't know how long it will take you to, to do things. Um, and, you know, getting, gaining that confidence to say, wait a minute, you know, two years ago, I managed that amount of titles at the same time, and it was a disaster. You know, I, I know I can't do this. So, you know, and then you, at that point you can say, all right, you know, actually, no, I can't. <laughs> And good time management, good project management is learning to say no. And saying no, you know, needs confidence. It needs time. Yeah. Because it's either that or you are spending nights. Like I, I used to have one side of my bed just like be for my laptop. Because, oh you know, I'd go to sleep and it'd be the last thing I touched. And I'd wake up and it would be the first thing I touched. <laughs> what a pitiful life. You say, you say but, that so poetically, Tabi. So. You say it exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, I mean, you can always compromise your quality of life, um, you know, and, and like lots of wine helps. Um, <laughs> so it's it's really just learning how to cope. There was, there, there was a time in my life where I worked really hard. I don't anymore. I, I don't Fine. work hard. <laughs> um, there was the, I, when I employed people, I made sure that I delegated and then the pandemic happened and all of that. And I was just like, since the pandemic, I also have I had a small baby, I had a baby during the pandemic. So I've really slowed down my life and really it's nice. So sometimes I feel bad for like just napping during the day just <laughs> from that PTSD of my former life. <laughs> but, but you, you, it's really, yeah, you have to, like Christopher says, you have to learn how to say no. And when I was working really hard, it was because the bulk of my day would be taken up by, um, you know, media interviews, appearing here, talking here, doing this. And that's all that also came from the burden of being the only black, the first black woman, you know, all of that. And just why we need so many going back to the very first question we had about why do we need more black practitioners so that none of us are distracted sort of doing work. Um, so that that is but lots of wine, promise you. <laughs> I love, I love the suggestion. If I may add, scientifically, I think in the, I, I sometimes I like to process it. So the thing about it, like you say, voluminous work, let's imagine how, how long could the work be? A hundred thousand words. In a hundred thousand words in manuscript pages could be how many? Like close to 300, 350 pages. Maybe I'm just calculating. And then you say you want to do this in a short time. What is a short time? Three months. And then say that this is new work and you have to do substantive editing, which means that there has to be back and forth, depending on your system as an editor, whether you do a lot of back and forth with a person. So you have to ask yourself, if you do say that you're going to do this thing in 90 days, 90 days, you're going to, you're going to edit this thing in 90 days. You know, are you, can you determine how long it's going to take you to edit something, send it back to the writer, get feedback? Because every time they send it back, you have to probably do some, some more work. So send it back to the writer, do the work again. Then you, the other ones are still there. Now you're still editing, over. but you're still, you've gone back to chapter one to review what they have, they have done. And then you go back. So you have to determine and put a timeline. Okay, you say seven days to this. You can time yourself. You can say, okay, this is how I'm going to be disciplined. I'm going to dedicate seven days to the review or when the, it's returned. And I'm going to do, and when you probably do it that way, you'll be able to tell whether or not you can edit something within a short time, but I don't recommend it, to be honest. I do not. Standard-wise, I think it takes us about six months to a year to edit new work, you know, to edit new work when we are trying to release it. Sometimes it even takes more because it goes through at least two levels of copy editing, substantive editing, two levels of copy editing, then proofreading, then typesetting, then proofreading, you know, so you can just imagine the amount of dedication and time and attention you have to pay to something. But if you're yeah, free, when you... <laughs> sorry, but if you're freelancing and you you ed, you freelance to put food in your belly, you will have to drink a lot of wine, like Tabisa said. <laughs> you will have to drink a lot of wine. Uh, um, yeah, I think some people see you. And actually, with editorial, actually, you know, we do these timelines and we try to make it more reasonable. It's more likely you have to read a lot in short notes where an agent might say, I'm a manuscript and I need the response for a short amount of time. So a lot of out of hours reading is a lot of aspects of the glamorous life of publishing. And that's where I think you get some of those late nights too. Um, but yeah, I think 
I was saying, you know, just be honest with yourself about your, your capabilities. Don't feel bad about taking a nap in the middle of the day if you need to, to recover. Um, and editing needs a certain head frame. So, you know, if you know you're not going to get substantial edits done that day, maybe work on your other tasks. They need to get done and take a break and work on editing another time when you're in the right headspace for it as well. Um, but I think I think we'll end it there because we're going to be over. And you, um, I think we could talk about editing all day long if you kept going. There's just so many up things to cover that we haven't touched on. But um, this is a really great conversation. Thank you very much, all three of you, for joining. You've been a great panel. And thank you, everybody, for making your time on this afternoon to come join us. Um, so we're going to have more of these conversations. We've done accident editing yesterday. That's available on YouTube. This will also be up. Um, the things we mentioned today, if you have any more questions that we didn't get to, tag us on Twitter, or DM us, let us know. We'll try and get back to you with any more guidance if you like we have. We have panels on design, sales and marketing and book promotion coming up. Our next panel is on design for publishing happening next week on the 18th at the same time. Um, so, you know, set a reminder, join us. You can check out the rest of our schedule on our websites. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Thank okay. you, Leila. And thank you. Thank you very, me. Leila. Thank Bye. you. Very nice meeting Christopher. Very nice meeting you. Lovely meeting you both. You it's so, it's so amazing guys. to meet two thank people you. who are, you know, so far away, but we sort of like have like such common experiences. It's amazing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of love in the chat too. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye everyone. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.